Hello, everybody, and welcome back to part two of our module nine discussion of financial statement analysis. Now, in this part two, we are covering the financial statement ratio analysis. We covered horizontal and trend analysis in part one and vertical analysis, and now we're covering ratio analysis. So the categories of the different types of ratios we're going to be calculating are liquidity ratios, which are current short-term ratios, generally dealing with current assets and current liabilities, but they also have a few other things that come into play. Activity ratios, which deal with the various turnovers and days sales type entries. We'll see what that means in a bit. Profitability and market ratios. If you're an investor, these tend to be the ones you're really most focused on. They're all important, but the profitability and market ratios are much more commonly heard. Even if you're not an investor, you've probably heard some of the terms. And then the final ones are more long-term uh, ratios, debt, financial leverage, solvency ratios. These deal with longer-term assets and liabilities, and even equity. Now, what I do want to mention here, these are pretty common terms for these categories, but there are some di different terms that are used from time to time, depending on which textbook, which video, which, uh, you know, what you're, whatever you're reading, they might be slightly different. So these are the four most common terms that I've seen across my teaching history. So let's start with the liquidity ratio, ratios. So again, we're dealing with current assets and current liabilities. The first one is the oddest one because it's not really a ratio. A ratio, by definition, is a fraction. You're dividing. The working capital is a subtraction problem. So it's a dollar amount. But working capital uh, is calculated by taking your current assets minus the current liabilities. Now, hopefully, you have more current assets than you do current liabilities. Otherwise, you're going to run into trouble very quickly. You won't even be able to pay your bills this year unless some major change happens. That's the concern there. A higher working capital is safe, safer. But the problem with a lot of things, you want to find a happy medium. There is such a thing as being too safe, not taking enough risks. You're missing out on potentially higher rewards. Yes, again, it's safe. The investors might not like too safe, though, because they know they're missing out on potential returns for slightly riskier investments. So it's just kind of finding a happy medium there. The current ratio is the exact same calculation, only now it's a division problem. Same elements being divided. Current assets divided by current liabilities. Again, current means that it is going to, for assets, it means they're going to be used within a year or converted to cash within a year. For liabilities, it means they're due within a year. So you have to have the current assets to pay the current liabilities, preferably cash. Again, a higher ratio is safer. That means you had more assets than liabilities. But again, you can be too safe. You're missing out on potential returns. Now, we could take this current ratio and start whittling away at these assets, which is exactly what the next ratio does. It takes some of the current assets, and we're still dividing by all current liabilities. So when I say some, it's the cash, the short-term investments, and the accounts receivable. The items that we should be able to convert to cash fairly quickly. Notably, there are two big current assets that are missing. Inventory is probably the biggest. It's the difference between current and liquid or current and asset test ratio. The thought here is that there's a risk that if we have a lot of inventory, we might not be able to sell it. There might be a lot of reasons. The economy may shut down as we just experienced a few years back. We have a lot of inventory. We can't even open up our store. Or the the inventory may become obsolete. It may become damaged. It may become stolen. So there are a lot of reasons in a worst-case scenario where we don't want to rely too heavily on being able to sell that inventory quickly. So we carve it out of this ratio to get a better, not quite worst case, but closer to worst case scenario for just better risk assessment. The other big current asset we leave out of here would be all of your various prepaid expenses, like prepaid rent, prepaid insurance, 
the thought is that once you've paid for them, you're probably not going to be able to get a refund and use that cash for something else. The uh, that that prepaid rent is just going to be used in the next few months. So we carve that out as well. It's a more stringent version of the current ratio. It's again fewer assets are included, but we're still calculating the same liabilities. Now, by the way, there are even further variants of this ratio that get closer and closer to worst case. You basically keep carving out more and more of these current assets, take away the accounts receivable, take away the investments, and then you're left with just the cash ratio, cash divided by current liabilities. Uh, if we just could use the cash we have today, would we be able to pay off our current liabilities? By the way, as rules of thumb, these are very, very rough rules of thumb. They don't always apply to all industries and all companies. But in the past, historically, 2.0 has been seen as kind of a safe current ratio. We have twice as many current assets as we need to pay our current liabilities. 1.0 has been seen as a good asset test ratio. With these assets only, we have at least enough to pay our current liabilities. Now let's move on to the activity ratios. So activity, we're identifying how efficiently we're operating, how efficiently we're using our assets to, to run the company, to generate sales generally. So the total asset turnover ratio. When you think of a turnover, we're basically taking some sort of, it, it's usually a sales figure, but there's one exception we'll see later, but it's sales divided by some type of asset, some average of our assets. By average, I mean the beginning balance plus the ending balance divided by two. It's not really a weighted average. It's just a simple average. Total asset turnover, obviously it tells us we're using our total assets. So how efficiently did the company use those total assets, equipment, land, inventory, cash, everything, to generate sales? We would hope we can generate a lot of sales without having a whole lot of investment. That'd be a perfect world. We generate more and more sales, and we don't have to have a lot of assets to do so. Think of a company, you know, especially back in the uh, you know 80s, think of a computer software company where they're operating out of their garage. Just uh, operating out of the garage, they have just a couple of computers, no real major physical tangible assets, yet they, they hit a home run and are able to generate huge amounts of sales on the software they just developed with just a couple of computers. That would be an absolute perfect case for the total asset turnover ratio. They'd have a lot of sales divided by very few assets. On the other hand, think of an airline. Yes, they're big, they generate a lot of sales, but they have a lot of assets that are required to do so. So that's the thought here. The key thing to note is this doesn't really tell us anything about the profit of the company. They may be generating a lot of sales, but those sales are barely making a profit. There's Most of the sale value is eaten up as cost. So just keep that in mind. We'll see that later. The accounts receivable turnover ratio, we're still taking sales. We're dividing it by average accounts receivables. So we want to know here, we, we know that accounts receivables, if we use them wisely, it means we have more flexible payment terms. We may be able to convince customers to buy from us and generate more sales. But we want to know how efficiently we're using those credit policies to generate sales. We don't want to just sell things to anybody and everybody without doing any sort of credit check whatsoever because there's a high risk we'll never be able to collect some of those accounts receivables. Sales are worthless if you can never collect on them. That's the point. So a higher ratio here means that we have a more efficient collection, but a lower ratio here might mean that we have too many accounts receivables that we're not collecting and compared to our sales, or it might also mean that we just don't have a lot of sales to begin with because we really don't have any accounts receivables. So it could go a few different ways, but we'd prefer this to be high 
the higher it is, the more efficiently we're, con we're collecting on our receivables and still generating sales. Now let's take a derivative of that ratio. So we took the accounts receivable turnover ratio. We can convert it into something called the number of days sales in accounts receivable, also known as the average collection period. This becomes more understandable and it's very, very valuable to companies. There are actually three ways to calculate this. And they're mathematically the same, they're just derivatives of one another. But if we take the ending accounts receivable balance, just the ending balance at the end of the year, divided by the average daily sales, which would be annual sales divided by 365. So the average daily sales, we're basically saying, hey, whatever account balance we have, divided by the average daily sales, that tells us on average how long it's, it did or it will take us to collect those accounts receivables, how many days. Now, if we have a 30-day credit policy, hopefully this is less than 30 days. If it goes over 30 days on average, that means we're having trouble collecting within our required period. Option two is to take our accounts receivable turnover calculation and reverse it. Numerator goes to denominator, denominator goes to numerator. So instead of sales divided by average accounts receivables, now we're doing average accounts receivables divided by sales. And then to get a day figure, because this is just going to be a percentage, we convert it by multiplying by 365, and it'll give us a number of days. It'll, it'll equal the number of days from option one. Just a different way of getting there. Option three, which might be the quickest if you already know the accounts receivable turnover ratio, just simply take 365 days and divide it by the accounts receivable turnover ratio and you'll get the number of days in account or the number of days sales in accounts receivable the average collection period again the lower this is the better but if we have it too low and we have too tight of a credit policy we may not be able to generate a lot of sales we we only allow a small percentage of our customers to buy on credit that means we could be losing out on a lot of sales that if we loosened our policy just a little bit, took on a little bit more risk, we might be able to generate a lot more sales. Another turnover ratio, ratio is the inventory turnover ratio. This is the oddball of the group because it does not use sales in the numerator like every other turnover ratio does. Instead, it uses cost of goods sold. Specifically, we're taking cost of goods sold divided by average inventories. Now the reason this particular turnover ratio uses cost of goods sold instead is that inventory is measured in that same cost that's in the cost of goods sold. The cost per unit. It's, it's, we're comparing apples and apples here. There, we cannot say that about any of the other ratios. They don't really relate to sales perfectly. I guess one could argue the accounts receivable does because that's generated by sales. But assets, all the other assets, don't really directly relate to sales. We just use sales as a proxy. Here, with inventory, we have a perfect proxy, cost of goods sold, or perfect comparison, so we use it. So again, annual cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory, beginning plus ending, divided by two. This tells us how many times the inventory has turned over throughout the year. So what I like to do to illustrate this is think of a very simple company that has exactly one product and one shelf for that product to go on. Day one, they fill up that shelf. Then throughout the month, they gradually empty the shelf out. People buy stuff. They fill it up again, people empty it out. They fill it up again, and people empty it out. Each of those times is a turnover. You certainly hope that that turns over many, many, many times throughout the year. But think about it. There are a couple ways that you could increase that. You could make a smaller shelf, and obviously you'd have to fill it back up much more quickly and frequently. If So you're, you're reducing your average inventory on hand, but you're still selling a lot. On the other hand, let's say you made several shelves, it would take a lot longer to, to deplete those 
and fill them back up so you'd have a lower turnover ratio. So we want to know how efficiently they're using their inventory asset to generate sales and then, of course, cost of goods sold. We can take a derivative of that ratio as well to calculate the day's sales and inventory. This is sometimes referred to as the time until stock out. There are a variety of names for this, but the idea is it tells us two things. How many days will it take us on average to sell this inventory? And that at the same time, that tells us if for some reason we could not buy any more inventory, everything's shut down, there's supply chain issues, how long will our inventory last until we stock out? So it tells you a few different things. Now the, the options we have here are the same basic options as with the day sales and accounts receivable. You could take ending inventory divided by average daily cost of goods sold. Option two, you could just flat out reverse the inventory calculation and multiply it by 365. Or option three, take 365 and divide it by that inventory turnover ratio. Now we'll move on to the profitability and market ratios. Again, these might be the more, the more recognizable ratios. Return on investment. Probably the most basic ratio and really the first ratio people tend to use in their lives, even if they don't haven't heard the term before. ROI, the thought is it's your net income or whatever return you're trying to measure divided by the average total assets that you're investing. Think about a bank account. What is your interest income divided by what principal do you have in the bank? That's ROI as well. What's your rate of return? It's the same idea. Here we're just comparing it to total assets because that's what we've invested in the company to help it operate and generate a net income. So the return, the higher the better, of course, but the, the caveat there is that if you appear more and more and more profitable, especially if you have financial statements that are visible to others, it's going to attract more competition. If that industry is grow for you is growing and you're getting a lot more customers, somebody out there is going to see that and they're going to want a piece. They're going to want to try to get in your industry as well and now all of a sudden you have more competition. So just something to think about there. Doesn't mean it's bad, but it's it's competition. Now ROI. We could just simply take it like this and calculate a return on investment, but it won't really tell us why we had the return on investment we did, good or bad. We could break it out into what's known as the DuPont model and break it into two pieces. The profit margin, in other words, telling us for every sale we make, how much profit percentage do we make, and then multiply that by the total asset turnover, which tells us for every asset we have, or for the total assets we have, how many sales we're able to generate. We, if we generate a lot of sales, and each of those are profitable, we're going to have a huge ROI. Now, the profit margin is net income divided by sales. That's the calculation for the profit margin. The asset turnover ratio, as we saw earlier, is sales divided by average total assets. So this will give you, doing it this long way, We'll give you the exact same calculation as here, net income divided by average total assets. The reason for that goes back to cross cancellation. If you remember multiplying fractions, when you have two fractions you're multiplying and the denominator of one is the same as the numerator of the other, you can cancel those two and merge the equation where you would be left with net income divided by average total assets, which is exactly what we have for ROI. So that's why this works, but breaking it down like this and getting the profit margin and total asset turnover helps to give us a much better idea of why we are profitable. Maybe we're a discount operation where we have a heck of a lot of sales, but every sale just barely has a profit margin. We could still be profitable that way, or we could be a very high-end retailer where we don't have many sales at all, but every sale we do have is huge profit margin.
you can be profitable that way too. The return on equity, ROE, is similar to the return on investment. The difference is with return on investment, let's jump back a bit. We're using the average of all of the assets we have in the company, regardless of how we finance them. By borrowing money, by issuing stock, it didn't matter, all of the assets. ROE looks only at the assets that were financed through investment like stock. We take out the borrowing money and we're basically looking at only the owner's equity that we use to buy assets. Same net income, average owner's equity. We want to know how much of a return was the company able to make on just their own invested funds. No borrowed money, just invested funds. Higher is still better, but and this may be higher or lower. Well, well, I shouldn't say lower. It's uh, the average owner's equity at a minimum is going to be equal to assets. Next, we're going to look at earnings per share, another very common ratio if you're involved in investing at all. The earnings per share, or EPS, is calculated by taking earnings, but specifically I want to mention these are earnings that are available for common shareholders. So it's the net income, but we have to subtract out preferred dividends. And the reason for that is that that money, even though it's not an expense, is never going to be available for common shareholders to receive. So that would subtract that out. And then we're dividing it by the weighted average number of common shares outstanding. So with all these earnings, how many shares did we have to issue to be able to generate these earnings? The idea here is that this is kind of an indication of how much value accrues to this individual company, to this individual share of stock, this investor. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get that money, but it's how much value has accrued. It's just a good metric to use. Now, the weighted average share is outstanding. I know we talked about that in the income statement module earlier, but it's basically weighted by the amount of time throughout the year that those particular shares have been outstanding. If we had a 1,000 shares that have been around for the entire year, but then midway through the year, we also purchased another 1,000 share, or we issued another 1,000 shares, then our weighted shares outstanding would be 1,000 plus half of the second 1,000. So it would be 1,500. That's a simplified version of that. So we have earnings per share. Now, we needed to calculate that first to get onto this next one called the price earnings ratio or the earnings multiplier, PE ratio, a variety of terms for it. This ratio is calculated by taking the market price per share at that point in time, what we could go out on the open market and buy that share for, divided by that same earnings per share. The thought is that if I'm paying, let's say, $10 for this share, and I'm getting $2 earnings per share. My multiplier would be 5. My ratio would be 5. The question is, why am I paying 5 times as much as I'm expecting to get back in value this year? And again, I use the term value. I don't mean that I'm necessarily getting that $2 earnings per share. It might be reinvested in the company, but it's a value indicator. So why would I pay $10 for something that I'm really only getting value of $2 per share for. And there are a couple of reasons. First of all, you hope you don't just get this $2 one year. You hope you get it for several years for the for foreseeable future. Once you buy the share, you're entitled to earnings per share throughout the life of the share until you sell it. Second reason, though, and this is perhaps the most important reason, is that you hope the earnings per share will increase over time. You want to be in a profitable investment. So that's the idea there as well. You're willing to pay a lot more than what you're getting in earnings per share to buy into the potential growth of that stock. That's what it's all about. Dividend yield. Now this goes to really what we are getting paid. So specifically, it's the annual dividend per share that we are actually receiving divided by the market price per share of stock. So if we get a dividend of a dollar per share and we paid $10 for that share, our dividend yield is 
this is the immediate return on investment that we get every year. Now again, this is only one of the returns. We get the dividend yield for some stocks. Some stock doesn't even pay a dividend. That's one of our returns. The other return is more long-term, and it's the growth of the stock before we end up selling it. Now the dividend payout. This goes back to what I was talking about earlier, how the earnings per share is just kind of a value proxy. We don't necessarily get it immediately. The dividend payout ratio tells us just how much of that earnings per share we do get. It's the annual dividend per share divided by the annual earnings per share. If this company pays out all of its earnings, this would be a 100% ratio which is pretty common, or pretty uncommon, I'm sorry, pretty pretty rare. Most companies take at least some portion of their earnings and reinvest it in the company to grow in the future. Now, for the last couple of slides, we'll move on to a couple of debt ratios. There are more ratios out there. These are just some of the bigger ones. The first one is the debt ratio itself. This compares total liabilities, the debt, to really to total assets, which are equal to total liabilities plus equity. But I broke it out this way to show that we're trying to compare how much of our total investment was debt versus everything, you know, debt plus equity. So that's the debt ratio. Out of all the financing we have as a company, what percentage of it is debt financing versus equity financing? That's what we're getting at here. So the next ratio does something very similar. It's called the debt to equity ratio. And here we're directly comparing debt to equity. Whereas with this debt ratio, it's going to be less than 100% because total liabilities are some component of the two. Now I suppose in a worst case scenario, every single bit of your financing could be debt and then you'd be exactly 100%. But generally... You're going to have some level of owner's equity, hopefully a large level of owner's equity. You prefer this ratio to be smaller to show less risk to investors. With the debt to equity ratio, you're comparing debt to equity. If you have more debt than equity, this ratio is going to be above one, which is risky. If you have less debt than equity, it's going to be below one, which is less risky. So that's what this compares. And the final ratio we have here is the times interest earned ratio. Now this is, basically it's a risk indicator as well. All these leverage ratios are risk indicators, for, mainly for creditors. They want to know how risky this company is. And this one is specifically for creditors because it deals with interest. They want to make sure they're going to get their interest payment. They know that's all they'll get. But they want to make darn sure that they're at least going to, that they are going to get that, and that there's little risk they won't get it. So to do this, we take the EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, also known as operating income. We take that and divide it by just the interest expense. So hopefully, let's say we have, I'm just going to throw out some weird examples. Let's say we have a hundred thousand dollars of operating income and only a thousand dollars of interest expense. We have a hundred times as much as we need to pay our interest. There's extremely little risk to creditors that we're not going to be able to pay interest. So that's a, the higher the better, the higher the less risk. But if we had a one thousand one hundred dollars of operating income and a thousand dollars of interest expense, our creditors might be a bit concerned because there's very little wiggle room before we all of a sudden can't afford our interest expense. That's the idea here. So the higher the better, the less risk for the investors. And that takes us to the end of our financial statement analysis ratio discussion for part two. Hopefully this has helped to clarify a lot of the financial analysis topics you might have had. But please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to talking to you in the next session.